Today, three of the participants are fellows at the Institute, Deborah Levy, Bob O'Mealy, and Amit Choudhury. Also participating from the Institute is Susan Boynton, who's the Institute's resident faculty director and a professor of music and historical musicology at Columbia. Um, the idea behind the creation of the Institute is to question established ways in which knowledge is defined, produced, and taught. When Amit was awarded a fellowship here, one of his first questions was whether we would agree to host his annual symposium of literary activism. And quite naturally and very enthusiastically, we said yes. It seemed like a perfect fit. The first Against Storytelling Symposium took place in December 2014 in Calcutta and has happened each year uh, ever since in Calcutta, but also Delhi, Oxford, and now Paris. Um, Amit is the founder of the symposium and among many other things, too long to list, but I'll say a few. He's a novelist, an essayist, a composer, a classical Indian musician, a singer with a penchant for American country music. And uh, he's also the recipient of many literary awards, the Commonwealth Literature Prize, the Betty Trask Award, the Encore Prize, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and also the Indian Government Satya Academy Award. He also teaches literature at the University of East Anglia, and we're delighted, Amit, that you have chosen Reed Hall to host your symposium this year. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, Marie, for um, hosting this symposium, and um, thanks to you, to Mark, for for agreeing to to sort of uh, um, take on and embrace this idea. Uh, and thanks uh, to you all for coming on, uh, uh, you know, this this afternoon, this siesta break. Um, and um, I'll just say a few words about the symposiums, and 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 then I'll allow this this one to begin. Uh, we we are running a bit late, but deliberately so because pe people have been held up by. Uh, what's been going on outside. Uh, so people are still coming in, apparently. Um, so uh, the, the, the symposiums are in a series called Literary Activism. And, uh, and, and th 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 this is the second of the symposiums on, uh, on e against storytelling. Um, the first of the literary activism uh, Symposiums happened in December 2014, as, as Murray said, and was a, generally a part of an experiment to, to bring uh, all kinds of people from all over the world uh, to Calcutta, uh, a city of modernity, uh, a, a great city of modernity long in decline, and see how, uh, how that worked. Um, and, and the University of East Anglia, uh, in partnership with other institutions in India, uh, hosted these symposiums. And um, the University of East Anglia began to become active in India from 2013 onwards. I was part of that. So was John Cook. It was, in fact, John Cook who wanted this to happen. And what began was uh, were, were crea um, two annual creative writing workshops uh, in, in Calcutta, which, which um, again was an experiment in terms of seeing whether if, if we opened it up uh, to potential participants from all over the world, rather than people from Calcutta or India, uh, whether they would turn up. And they did, even from Norwich, where the University of East Anglia is. Uh, so, uh, um, so, so, so that, that was interesting to see how that worked. Um, and very much in keeping with a, a history of the modernity of that city, which had been through a kind of interruption and is still going through that, where that, that kind of mm, those sorts of visitors had become fewer. But, but, but those were precisely the kinds of visits that had formed that city uh, from the 19th century onwards. Um, 
But since m my uh, my uh, interest in, in teaching traditional creative writing, Iowa style w workshopped uh, kind of classes is limited unless I can kind of do something different with, with that model. Uh, I also wanted to start something else, and that's the idea that writers and artists uh, had, had things to think about and talk about in relation to their, to their art or craft that actually went beyond craft. So as writers, we were uh, that the Iowa model, but also that the way things were uh, um, encouraged us to talk about writing as long as we, we stuck to craft. Uh, and sometimes if we had things to say, it should be about which country we came from and what that meant. Uh, but as, as to the practice of, as to creative practice and the practice of literature, uh, th th that was something that nobody talked about because certainly um, the, 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 the departments of English had, had become far more sociological in their approach. And if they did look at uh, literary texts. It was primarily, I mean, that, that phase of looking at literary texts, especially if they came from, well, whatever part of the world, really, as, as a site of, um, of a power struggle and to, and to unearth the actual workings of what that power struggle had been doing in creating that text. And that became the primary activity, it seemed, for a lot of literary studies. Um, and we were talking about craft at literary festivals. But it seemed that we did actually, I mean, lots of people, academics, uh, writers, actually did want to talk about uh, uh, what it meant, what creative practice meant today at a time when the market had taken over from the 90s onwards. And not only had the market taken over, but the market had taken over the language of valuation, which the literary departments would have nothing more to do with. So the language of valuation meaning, this is a masterpiece, that is a, no a great novel, uh, that is a classic. Uh, um, the, the canons had been dismantled and so had these, the, the, what, whatever foundation lay behind these words had been dismantled in the, in the literary departments. Uh, the, uh, the publishers had taken on this language robustly and were busy publishing masterpieces all the time. Uh, we, we needed to understand what this meant, the, the publication of the masterpiece you know, every, every month or every other month, and the publication of a classic, as, 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 as with Morrissey's autobiography. Uh, I keep saying that in, in, in the, there was a watershed moment in 1992 or so when Vikram Seth interviewed his, uh, uh, his, 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 his potential literary agents to be to find out who would sell his new book, A Suitable Boy, uh, the best and most aggressively. Uh, but Morrissey didn't do that. Morrissey just said to Penguin, you can publish my book as long as you publish it as a classic. So he knew the, 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 the term. That, so there was no point in looking at money anymore. The terms had been reified completely by the market. So what you want now is classic status uh, before you get published. And, and, and his hunch was right because the book, unlike I think all other classics maybe, went straight to number one on publication in the charts. So, um, so we were looking at this field uh, and, and trying to understand what creative practice and the language with which we describe creative practice might mean now and how we could um, look again at the mm, at the ambivalences, ambiguities, and, and more difficult to pin down qualities of the literary. So not to say that the literary is, is wonderful and improving, not at all, but to look at these qualities that are more difficult to pin down. And, and, and that is what uh, literary activism means. Uh, so it's not activism in the usual sense of, of uh, sort of what's go maybe going on out there, very necessary, uh, going out onto the streets, to, 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 to protest about a category we already know, but to look into a category which we can never completely know, and therefore need to be, um, the category is an active category, 
uh, the, so the, the activism in that sense is about not being fixed or pinned down. Um, again, storytelling is a is 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 a theme uh, which I'd been wanting to do for a while. Uh, uh, at a certain um, congregation, not dissimilar to this one, when I was asked to speak, uh, uh, I happened to say in an aside when I was speaking, "Fuck storytelling." Uh, and 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 I was I was uh, uh, my interlocutor uh, later said how how shocked uh, she was not not because I'd used that word but because I had had to go at storytelling in that way so it I think story it's it's very nervous making to have a a symposium called against storytelling because storytelling is a sacred category and today we know when things are sacred uh, if if they cause um, Offense to somebody, and 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 uh, somebody said that against storytelling echoes Sontag's, the title of Sontag's essay against uh, interpretation, uh, and and that's well spotted. It's, it wasn't an intentional echo, but uh, but I think interpretation uh, was ubiquitous, but but wasn't uh, sacred, and so uh, one one didn't have to feel nervous saying. I'm against interpretation, uh, but when you say I'm against storytelling, you you seem to be um, saying something that's slightly uh, scandalous and regrettable. Um, storytelling by storytelling, I suppose one of the things I mean is representation. So that's not far away from. It's it's a kind of cousin of interpretation or what's being interpreted against representation then is might be one way of looking at it um, this is not meant to be hostile to stories or storytelling the 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 intention of the symposium and this is the the, the, the earlier symposium happened in delhi at the beginning of 2018 the intention is to celebrate but not celebrate in the way we say when we say we are, we, are, we, are, we are telling each other stories, not that celebration, to find if there are other, other kinds of, other ways of being celebratory that takes us outside of this particular mode of celebration. So again, storytelling will begin with Jeremy Harding uh, as our first speaker, chaired by Susan Boynton, the resident faculty director and professor of music at Columbia. We're very glad that they're taking part. Susan will uh, introduce Jeremy. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone, and um, thank you, Amit, for those interesting reflections. As a musicologist, we have many. I have many thoughts about storytelling, but I'll hold them for another time and introduce our first speaker, Jeremy Harding, who is a writer and contributing editor at the London Review of Books. In the London Review of Books, The Nation, Granta Magazine, and many other publications, he has published essays on a very wide range of subjects in politics, the arts, and literature, in France, throughout the world. He is the author of several books, including The Uninvited Refugees at the Rich Man's Gate, uh, Border Vigils, Keeping Migrants Out of the Rich World, um, Small Wars, Small Mercies, which was published in revised form as The Fate of Africa, and his memoir, Mother Country. He's translated Vincent Descombe's um, Grammaire d'Objet on two, genres, uh, on two genres as objects of all sorts, a philosophical grammar. And he's also translated poems of Arthur Rimbaud. Today, he's going to speak on journalism and the triumph of the story, a personal narrative. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Amit. Thank you, Marie. Um, and thanks to the Institute. Yeah, um, I'm a journalist. Uh, I'm not a scholar. Being a journalist means that I mostly listen to people. I don't speak to them. 
so you'll forgive me if I'm mostly reading rather than seeming to address you directly. Um, and I'm going to talk about what it is that journalists might want to do when they're not writing stories. When, when I started out as a journalist, I had the makings of a very poor one. The pieces I turned in didn't tell stories with a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I guess, looking back, they were, they were light on information, even when they were a bit like field reports about real incidents and real events. Um, and this began to change when I was asked to write by more challenging editors. Um, and I remember when it happened, I'd been traveling on the rebel side during the war in Eritrea. Um, it was an independent struggle that set the Eritreans against the colonial regime in Addis Ababa, as they saw it. It had complicated causes, and it took many serpentine turns. I believed it was important to explain all this, um, and I felt the need to pack in information almost for the first time. But when the editors got back to me, they said the historical stuff, the background, was, um, was too much. <laughs> they found it hard to fight through my thickets of detail. I went over it again, thinning down, and trying not to travesty the story with too many shortcuts. They read it over, and now they said they weren't really sure. Um, the path was certainly clearer, but it seemed bland and uninflected. <laughs> so what were we to do? <laughs> I went back and started reseeding my thickets, um, and after more toing and froing, it, it sorted itself out to everyone's satisfaction. But one of the things I came to understand as I began to write longer descriptive journalism was that I had a very tenuous sense of narrative and a very tenuous sense of structure. I really had none of the narrative prescience that shapes a piece of nonfiction and keeps the reader alongside. I noticed too that I tended to think of the overall structure not as an element of composition itself, and you'd have to say it's quite a decisive element, but more as a kind of clothes horse or a bit of weather-beaten trellis. And what mattered was the luminosity of the scenes I could bring to life or the crisp analogies that would allow readers to recognize where they were. And the point, as far as I could tell, was to deck that rickety trellis with as many of these shining, luminous moments as I could without descending into vulgarity. The more I had to do with my editors as the years went on, the better I became at anticipating their objections. And the, and the easier it was to follow their crucial rule, tell me a story. Practicality was the order of the day, or a good part of it. And it dawned on me as I worked my way into storytelling that I'd never thought of writing, even rudimentary kinds of writing, as an activity that served any purpose other than its own. By practical, I, I mean a tool for communication, uh, or maybe a, a process that eventuates in an outcome beyond the text itself, like a battlefield message from brigade headquarters or a writ issued by a lawyer. Um, and I was too caught up with the sensuousness of words, it seemed to me, their, their mobility, their playful disposition. And perhaps at a young age, I'd already sensed the materiality of language, although I never would have called it that at the time. And maybe too, as I grew older, the forceful, almost physical impression that language made on me obscured the fact that it was the defining social medium that shapes us all. Not that I'd have put it like that either. Um, but like everybody, I was party to the many ways it went about this shaping, definitions, descriptions, pinning things down, all the tasks that journalism, for instance, is supposed to do. And like everybody, I was already woven in from infancy. And I'm borrowing the image of, of, of weaving from an essay by Heidegger, a, a difficult late essay in the 1950s, called The Way to Language. There's a terrific passage where he suggests that as speaking persons, we are always part of something larger. Language itself, he writes, has woven us into its speaking. That's its possessive, like its own speaking. Language itself has woven us into its speaking. Two points uh, about this weaving in for me. Uh, I, find, I find it very helpful. First, is there anywhere better to belong than in language? It's a fabulous expanding cradle in our early years, which evolves into a labile home, and then into a city you know intimately, 
even though it reconfigures around you at every turn. It's a world that's always yours and always everybody else's. It's a proper commons. It's a kind of us. Still, I think the Heidegger image, the, the idea of an enormous multidimensional weaving is better. And here's the second point. I wonder if storytelling doesn't diminish the glory of this rich fabric in some way. An obvious way stories can do that is, is to, to lay it flat on the ground like a checkered carpet and invent gods and characters who can stamp all over it according to the laws of destiny. Another way might be to abstract a handful of filaments and attach them to characters so that action and motive seem to take precedence over the very medium in which we encounter them. Or rather, they tend to make the medium inconspicuous, as if it didn't really exist. Actually, I'm taking this further than I meant to, because if we do want language to be palpable, we could well end up favoring the idea that it is language which speaks, not the author. I'm quoting from Roland Barthes' famous essay in the 1960s on the death of the author, an idea triggered, by the way, by poetry, uh, by the verse of Stéphane Mallarmé. Uh, but really what's meant here by Barthes, is lang by language speaking, is that books and stories and poems and, uh, are susceptible to endless readings and that the reader is a supreme figure in literature. Saying that language speaks and not the author, as Barthes does, isn't the same as saying that we, all of us, writers and readers, are woven into whatever language does when we speak and it performs us. And it can't be fair, besides, to say about good storytellers that their agency is like basically footling in the greater scheme of things, than to who says there can't be writing that tells good stories and alerts us to the operations of the medium itself. But good, well-plotted stories can set off in a direction that readers may not, may not always want to take. We might not want a window onto very similitude. We might not want to read a story in which language is transparent to the telling, a story in which narrative and artful organization are doing so much work that we seem to be having an out-of-body experience as we read, transported, as people used to say, taken out of ourselves, and maybe also feeling we're no longer woven in. I had a couple, I'm going to talk about sex now, um, but in a most oblique way. I had a couple of counterintuitive insights about the transparency of language at a young age. And the one I'll tell you about has to do with sex. My very odd grandmother used to have a gardener, a beautiful man in his 40s. And this gardener worked around my grandmother's ramshackle house, doing a lot more than gardening. He fixed the pump from the well. He changed the mantles on the gas lamps. He repaired the roof and all the rest. But often he worked with a boy called Richard a boy in his teens. Richard was the son of a local artisan and his dad was a plumber. Richard thought it was a good idea to tell me about sex, which I mean, it was. And he set about this task with a great didactic passion. I was about six, I can't have been any older. Richard was clearing a little overgrown stand of trees near my grandparents' rusting grand, uh, uh, tractor. I can remember this very well. Um, and that's where these tutorials took place. And they had three elements. One, description. Anatomy of the mature adult. Two, narrative. Motives, actions, and outcomes. First, and then, and then, and eventually. And crucially, element three, they contain new, unfamiliar vocabulary. Obviously, I was allowed to ask questions, and I'm sure I did, but when I thought about these revelations in the evenings, as you would, I remember cycling quickly through the descriptive and narrative elements. They made a kind of straightforward sense. And I remember settling down to meditate at length on the new vocabulary. It's almost, <laughs> it's almost physical weight and it's terseness uh, with its one-syllable words doing a lot of the work. I'm sure, thinking back, that it was... I mean, I actually took these words into my mind and I played around with them. There were things I didn't believe. For example, I thought that the consonants that he'd given me couldn't be right. I could see what the central vowel sounds were for a lot of them, but maybe because he wasn't, you know, he was the son of a plumber, he might not know all about the consonants. So I started fiddling around with them. And I'm sure thinking back that it was the repetition of these words, rather than Richard's description and narrative, that persuaded me I'd understood what he was trying to explain. I realize in this symposium against storytelling, sorry, I've just told a story, but there we go. 
A child can't depend on the, on the feel of a word or a sensual lexicon to accede to the world. That little person also needs narratives, even partisan ideological narratives that, that can be discarded later. And she needs descriptions, whether they're accurate or wide of the mark. And the same is true for anyone, not just children, trying to apprehend in detail whatever it is that lies beyond their own direct experience. And I think I can test this out um, just by thinking about Dürer's famous woodcut of the rhinoceros, um, which many of you must know. The creature was a, a gift to a Portuguese colonial governor in Gujarat, and the governor shipped this tragic animal to Lisbon in 1515. Um, it was an imperialist trophy. Dürer never set eyes on the rhinoceros, but it would have been impossible simply by repeating the name over and over, rhinoceros, rhinoceros, punning and playing around with the, with the word for a draftsman to come up with a reasonable likeness. Possibly Juris saw some sort of sketch. Uh, we know for sure that he worked from at least one description written in Lisbon. Even so, it requires craft, imagination, and a modicum of information for a person to represent a thing they've never set eyes on with a measure of accuracy. Nowadays, we'd say it's all about data. The right artificial intelligence program could do it without much difficulty. Part of my ambivalence about storytelling comes from the feeling that we already have the data. It's been acquired through a long transgenerational assimilation of a literary past and other narratives too, nursery rhymes, puppet shows, musicals, Hollywood movies. We no longer need a description of the rhinoceros, at least not in works of the imagination. And just to one side of this worry is another, in free range storytelling on the internet, social media especially, you can point to any animal you like. It could, it, it, it could be a gerbil or a golden retriever, and you could say, that is a rhinoceros. Uh, let me tell you why my description is better than yours. I say this in spite of the fact that there's plenty of great journalism on the web, and citizen journalism is journalism as good as it gets sometimes. But fiction, even shape-shifting metaphor, sorry, shift, even shape-shifting uh, memoir, are on strong ground when they depart from the stories we're used to hearing. When they seem to be saying, if you don't know you weren't bored, let me show you you were. After all, we know roughly how conventional stories are structured and how characters are meant to behave. And it follows, I guess, that we've also learned to anticipate what language is being asked to do. Moving around incognito, shifting the scenery as discreetly as possible, or being foregrounded from time to time to embody a character's voice or inhabit a narrator. I very much admire all this. Yet, don't we sometimes feel impatient, being led back through the basics of storytelling as though they were a mystery, as though we'd agreed again to put the blindfold on? And aren't we restless when we find we know how this will end and only vaguely appeased by a clever sequence of twists? Then there's the problem of getting three chapters into a book and already be be beginning to be able to see the movie. Where did we get this knowingness? It's not an advantage for a reader to see through writing. In fact, I'm convinced it's a curse. But we, but we are where we are, uh, with sensibilities still defined by certain strains of modernism. It's a bit like carrying a vi virus whose symptoms continue reappearing. But I recognize we're in dangerous territory here. I've used the M word, uh, and I could take us onto more shaky terrain by talking about experimental writing. Um, but there is, or was, a sort of modernism that forces us to see through and perhaps see beyond the machinery of storytelling and open ourselves up to different challenges, eventually different pleasures. There isn't really time to say what I mean, l l luckily. Um, but, but the modernist writers who, <laughs> especially across Peter's here, um, but the modernist writers who typify this knowingness have a disruptive interest in the formal properties of language and texts. So I'm not refer referring here to a modernism that makes radical claims about the human condition, the modernism of D.H. Lawrence, say, or at the opposite pole, Kafka. Uh, this, kind, this kind of storytelling observe, observes most of the formal protocols. Uh, its power resides in the content, as people used to say, 
I mean a more self-conscious experimental writing, writing driven by what Gertrude Stein called uh, an excess of consciousness, excess of consciousness. Um, um, Hyper-consciousness, I guess, is a better term. Um, a tremendous attention to the world, okay, but to the materials at a writer's disposal, the nature of perception, what it is that happens when we think we've seen something, uh, and the challenge of representing things afresh, or as Pound said, making, making it new. Gertrude Stein herself is a really good example, and there's no shortage of poets, including Hilda Doolittle, who made it new. Then, a little later on, the objectivists, including Lorene Niedeker, and on from there into the 50s. This approach assumes we're already familiar with the going conventions of various genres, and that we'll have no trouble when we encounter ellipsis, juxtaposition, or the gleaming fragment. If we do have trouble, then the implication is that we need to put in more imaginative and intellectual work. I'm going to sidle past stream of consciousness but I can't help thinking what a tremendous formal challenge it must have been at the time to represent the world through a tissue of inwardness. Um, there's another important strand which you might call blockbuster eclectic, an approach which forces out the boundaries of the text until the fabric gives way and we find ourselves in a glorious tangle of ideas and registers, sometimes even a tangle of genre. And men are better at women than this monumental excess of consciousness, which is why it's a visible tradition from very early on. You think of Rabelais, you think of Stern and Tristram Shandy, you flip ahead to Melville and ahead again to Joyce. Um, we could talk later about why Proust doesn't fall into this splurging, garrulous lineage for me, or why Beckett, sparse as his work became, seems to belong there somehow, and Wally Shoyenka too, before his work fell away. But for richer, for richer or poorer, sorry, for richer or poorer, I'm woven in as a reader by disruptive, surprising ways of telling stories. The more I try to compose coherent stories, as journalists do, the stronger my affection for stories that resist straightforward tellings and tellings that stray from the stories we thought they were about to tell. There are plenty of these around now, some of them written by people taking part in this symposium. It only enhances the stature of these authors when I say that I hear language speaking itself as they write, and I mean Heidegger's enfolding language. And of course, I hear the authors speaking too. Um, Deborah Levy, who's speaking later, isn't here, but let me break off and read for a moment. My first extract is from uh, her living autobiography, part two, The Cost of Living. We're into a passage about grief and there's an allusion to Hamlet that turns back on an address by Deborah or some kind of narrator to the mother she's mourning. We start with a quotation from Act 2, Scene 2 of Hamlet, and we go on from there. Words, words, words. I think he's trying to say that he's inconsolable, that he is Hamlet. Words can cover up everything. I don't see ghosts, but I, but I can hear you listening. The war is over for you. Here's some news from the living. I've been visited by birds all this year in one way or another. Some of them are real and some of them are less real. And a bit further on. I've stopped thinking about why I'm obsessed with birds, but it might be to do with death and renewal. The second extract is from something Amit wrote. I thought at first to quote from a tense and intriguing passage in, in his novel, A Friend of My Youth, where the narrator is being interviewed by a journalist and he talks about what he thinks fiction is and what it can do. Uh, but Amit wrote something else in a piece for Granta that's closer to what I'm trying to get at today. He was thinking about revisions he did on drafts of his novel, A Strange and Sublime Address. He found the process painful. In the second phase of revision, he writes, he decided not to compose joints between, joins between one salvage bit and another. I arranged paragraphs that had no innate sequentiality in order to give them an appearance of linearity. Each participated in and ignored the onward current. We're almost talking here about the second state of an abstract painting, with elements disposed according to the shifting rules of composition. I take a chance and say what Amit describes is more or less what Ezra Pound did when he recast the wasteland as a set, set of modernist fragments. 
And because this kind of approach to composing is far from dead and buried, I've begun to think that I completely misunderstood what was happening when I was thinking about these things in the 1980s. At the time, I believed it was the end of everything I was interested in. I thought we'd all been forced back on an idea of nature. Ultra-liberal market theories in the Reagan-Thatcher era suggested that we were indeed part of the animal kingdom and that their vision of political economy was thoroughly natural. Everything seemed suddenly to be naturalized. Even sport, force of nature, came to seem as indispensable as skill. And suddenly, modernism's habit of turning the mirror away from nature to look at representation itself appeared to be decadent. In the 1980s, we saw a flurry of neoclassicism in architecture, a conservative retreat in jazz, and in quite a lot of fiction, a return to the fully naturalized narrative that seems to mirror the real. Good narrative arc, true to life characters, exemplary use of perspective, something like a life class. That coincided, by the way, with a vogue for travel writing. The well-meaning white man was on the path again, venturing out among remote peoples to test the truths which unregulated free market capitalism claimed to embody. But the point I kept missing was just how resilient all those earlier strands actually were. In the 1980s, I was living in New York. I was befriended briefly by Kathy Acker. We played two, maybe three games of chess in her room in a bolted steel doored bunker that may have been the Gramercy Park Hotel. I can't remember, but I know I used to go in through Gramercy Park. And during that first game of chess, I thought, what if I win? She'll cast me into outer darkness. But, but what if I lose? Her apartment already felt like outer darkness to a sheltered European like myself, and I was already where I feared to be, looking across at my generous host who took, me, who, who took a liking to me because I was a waif in New York. I never grasped what she was doing in her novels or what her marginal books, as they seemed to me then, would amount to, but I do now. There is no master narrative, she wrote years later, nor realist perspective, to Adam Brait's social and historical facts. And so she'd just gone on writing to see where it took her. The business of writing, the narrator tells us in Amit's Friend of My Youth, is not about life, it's a form of living. The two happen simultaneously. I can see that, and there's something else. The writing I make sense of best is also a conspicuous form of thinking. It's almost as if I was following the movement of thought itself, Restless and elliptical, or fluent and discursive, jagged bursts with curious interruptions, or a constant gentle pressure like a breeze coming off the sea. Poems can do this, but so can prose, and that includes stories that are often about their own telling, which isn't quite the same as storytelling. Of course, I know as I'm talking that I have to start writing a story of my own a day or so from now. It'll be as clear and economical as I can make it. It will spell out as many difficulties as I think need spelling out. My editor will send me back to make a passage more explicit. Perhaps the piece will be cut to fit the page. Someone, possibly me, will introduce a spelling mistake in a last minute change. This is what I do. It's a working life and I really enjoy it. <laughs> so when I take a break and do some reading 10 days from now, what will I want to read? Will I go for a conventional work of fiction? Maybe a rollicking story? Because for all I've said today, I can find myself immersed and impressed by a wicked narrative with a mastery of all those not so secret arts. But what if the curse of knowingness descends on me again and I see through it? So perhaps I'll go for a different kind of artifice which won't try to carry me away. I feel woven into my favorite habitat where the writer and a language are drawing me back into that vast, reassuring fabric as I read. Thank you. Well, I suppose I have one question. Um, this may be coming too far out from left, in, from left field, but would you see an analogy in music for some of the processes that you talked about with language and the, the structuring experience of language, the sort of ontology of language within which the writer exists. Uh, 
Yes, I do. I, um, I'm not a musician and I'm not an expert on music, but I do listen to quite a lot of music. Is this on? Does it need to be on? Is, is that better? Okay. Um, I do. I, <laughs> I, I do. I do. I find myself listening to music which does exactly the kind of work that I've tried to describe going on in, in, in prose and verse uh, where representation comes into question. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking particularly of, of some of the jazz from Chicago Art Institute. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of Charlie Mingus. I think that these forms are forever evolving and though there's a lot of riffing and a lot of I wouldn't call it narcissism, but a kind of self-presentation uh, um, in the way that solos follow one another in jazz. There is definitely a call to re-examine what it is that you're doing when you're making music, particularly when you're working on old standards. The whole point of jazz is to take an old standard and make it really good jazz, almost unrecognizable, although you know as the listener that you have it in your head, so you're referring to a tradition at the same time as you're stretching it almost beyond capacity. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so, so kind of a, a, a self-consciousness and a reinscribing of oneself in the tradition, but the stretching of the tradition, the moving around, the self-reflection. Yeah, very much that reinscription as well. I think all these people who, the, the writers I'm talking about and the jazz musicians are fabulously egomaniacally ambitious about tradition and, can and, and the canon, yeah. So very much so. And do we have questions from the audience? If, if people are still thinking, I actually have another one of my own. Can I ask my own? Which is, um, you, I, I know that you're a, uh, a translator of poetry and I, we talked about this before the talk. Um, how does, translating poetry give you insight or fit into the processes that you were talking about? Or reading poetry? Um, I, I just read a lot of poetry when I have time, but uh, my working life has almost nothing to do with poetry. Mm -hmm. um, um, I happened to, when, when I translated Rambo, it was because I knew that work from very early on as a child. And when I came back to look at it again and write about it, I realized that the Penguin edition was no good anymore. I don't mean that the earlier versions weren't fine versions, but somehow the, the time had moved on and it was the moment had come for a new and fresh translation of Rambo. And I, I reckoned, you know, <laughs> madly that I could do it. And so I put myself forward to Penguin to do it. And in fact, I was okay with what I'd done. Because you had been living this, these words for a long yeah, time. So, and yeah, and then put them in suspension, brought them back, had another look at them and found that actually they meant quite a lot to me um, and that there was a way to, to try and get them, get them there in English. Yeah, yeah. Just, I see we have a question. Oh, you have a mic. Yes, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Uh, I uh, zeroed in on something you said at the very beginning that you're a journalist and a journalist listens rather than talks. And I began thinking about this day and age of what we call fake news that's being talked about a lot. And as a reader, I'm wondering if fake news is not someone in the guise of journalism who's not listening at all, who's talking to me. And who are the writers of fake news? <laughs> Maybe you'd like to comment on that. I, I can't possibly comment, but th thank you. It's a good question because I, 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 the only way I could answer it is to say that I think it's probably all of us, that there's some kind of amoeba-like forming, formation going on where, where stories kind of turn, they, they, they acquire new twists and turns as they kind of bowl along in this in this kind of ectoplasm, and fake news kind of makes itself in, in a way. I'm not saying that there aren't people who deliberately set out uh, to, put, to put a story about. I mean, I've been working on the Gilets Jaunes, and one of, one of the, uh, in my, my, my mind, less reputable members of the Gilets Jaunes put about a story that the killings in Strasbourg uh, last year um, uh, were really the work of the authorities in order to depress the numbers at Gilets Jaunes rallies the following week. That kind of fake news, you know, you can, you can more or less pinpoint a source, but actually these things roll along 
they're self-inventive, uh, uh, and 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 the, they accrete all kinds of stuff. And before it, it's a bit like those dust balls in the subway, hair balls. They just get bigger and bigger and bigger, and fat balls, you know, in the sewers. I don't know. It, it's very hard to to push them back to origin. It's, in fact, it's too late to ask their origin. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, the word scenic uh, jumped out when you were contrasting narrative with a number of other things, like luminous, uh, scenic, and it, as someone who works on Gertrude Stein's plays and theater, uh, I was interested in whether you might have something to say about the question of how she defines, or eventually comes to define, that anything uh, could be a play, that anything that wasn't a story could be a play. That there's something quite specifically uh, theatrical or dramatic or play-like if it wasn't telling a story. But, but her work, and the, the, the one to stick to, I think, for me, <clears throat> is Tender Buttons. The sentences are dramatized. Each sentence, it seems to me, without, it's a while since I read it, um, um, it seems to me to, to, to kind of stage itself. Um, and you ha you're, you're waiting for the next act which is another sentence, which probably or may, may not have anything to do with the one that came before. But there's this, there's this sense that every, every little passage she writes is a proscenium, and, that, and I, I think she's a very, yeah, a, a theatrical writer. That's the best I can say there. Do you, can, can you say? Well, I just think, no, that helps. It. Theatricalizing writing rather than creating story seems like there's a formal, something, something like a formal uh, comparison to be made there. It seems that that's something what you originally called the materialization of, of words, which is of course something that those of us interested in Stein are very interested in, but then also yeah. something about materialization and theatricalization is going together in some way, and that's, yeah. that's a very interesting to me. So, yeah. Thanks. One question is about your experience as a translator. Whether, there's a, whether you felt that uh, with Rambaud, and just in any experience of translating, that sense of the materiality of language, the probability of it, that, that sense of being woven into and, and then weaving, whether there's a, a particular or a qualitative dimension to that experience when you're translating. There's, there's a way in which that comes alive in translation that's different to other. That's really good to me. That's a really good question because I've, it makes me realize that when I was talking about that phrase from Heidegger, about being woven into it, it, the, the language and its speaking, I think it's only possible to feel that about the language of which you are a native speaker. So I feel woven into English, but I wouldn't feel woven into French. So there's a different kind of materiality going on there when you're having to deal with a, another language. For, for, part of the reason is that there are so many pitfalls you just, however good, however good you are at the source language, uh, you're going to risk uh, falling down a, you know, a hole at some point. So it's a nervous experience. But of course, that is, that is materiality. It's there in front of you. And actually, it, it, it's posing quite a lot of obstacles. It's asking you big questions that you wouldn't be asked by a text in your own language. Not the same questions anyway. So yeah, palpable and material, but. It, in a different way, uh, an, an uncomfortable way, not a, this isn't a way that enfolds you. Um, th thank you very much. I, I just wanted to ask a question which I hope tries to clarify something of the, um, the sort of objection to storytelling or the anxiety about storytelling. Perhaps objection is the wrong word. And in your talk, I thought you, you very, sort of beautifully brought out the fact that part of the demand for storytelling comes from your editors. If that's to say, it's experienced as an external constraint. You know, that, that, that in the service of a certain kind of communicability, a story is required. And you spoke very well about how that constrains you to, as it were, strip out elements of your prose. Um, and then there's another very interesting question that emerged out of it for me, and that is uh, 
the extent to which um, we have an internal resistance to storytelling because, of their, because stories are predictable, because they become predictable, because in a sense predictability is built into storytelling. And it's, it's at once its sort of enticement and, its, and our frustration mm. with it. Mm. And so there's a sort of, there's, I'm just trying to get clear in my mind what your sense is of that on, on the one hand, as it was the thing that appears to come from outside, the demand to make your story into a story, or to, as it were, to make your words into a story, and then the internal sense of this resistance that you have to, or one might build up to the predictability of storytelling. I think in my case, it's the fact that I have to produce coherent, reasoned stories that can stand up to scrutiny, a bit like going in front of a, the, going, the, the pleading at the bar or something yes. like that. That means that my own disposition takes me away from stories which have that, the same sorts of explicit, explicitness and structure and uh, uh, a sense of a pending outcome and all the rest. But I think what I... The really interesting thing about your question is you say we find stories slightly exasperating and I th my answer to that is partly because I said it, we've already got the data. We've acquired this through years of assimilation, generations of assimilation. But, but the, it's a puzzle, isn't it? <laughs> because we all, we're, all, we're, we're exasperated by stories but we are no different from any of our predecessors in our need for them. We, we need the very thing that exasperates us. We need to sit round the fire and be told those stories again, again and again and again. And we need to be exasperated. And I can't figure out what the relationship is. Is it that some cleverer people just feel exasperated and want to kind of, you know, kind of, you know, dis disparage the great storyteller? I don't know what it is. First of all, thank you for your presentation. It was great to hear you. Thinking about what you said too at the beginning about your role as a journalist and your kind of apologia that you were working as a journalist. Uh, and, and then if one thinks about the journalist's job of telling the story, go get the story. Um, you, you're f um, accentuating other things. Uh, um, this luminosity or spectacle. And I wonder if you can just say another word uh, about the, the, the job that a journalist has of telling what happened. Let's get the, the who, what, where part right at the same time that you want much more. Um, I, I can only speak for myself about this. Thank you for the question. A lot of journalism for me goes on in my mind while I'm actually out. So for example, I've spent the last two months with the Gilets Jaunes. And very often towards the end of a Saturday, when the demonstration has begun to get rough, I found I've had to be careful, not because I've put my way, put myself in the way of difficulty, but because I'm thinking quite a lot. And I'm thinking so much about what's happened that I haven't noticed that there's about to be a huge outburst of violence about, about 20 feet away from where I am. Because <laughs> I've actually been trying to think about what it is that's, that I wish to say, what it is that I wish to understand. So it's, 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 there is an awful lot of kind of very boring walking around and uh, nervousness about do I want to talk to people, will they want to talk to me, and all of that at the same time. Um, it's a very necessary part of my work. But there is a whole interior side to it with me saying, what, what did she mean? What did they mean? Is that really true? How can I check that? Um, and how does that fit into a, a story that's somehow bigger than this one? Because when this story is over, it must have some resonance that makes it worth having told. So there's all, all that going on as well. Um, but the best work I've ever done as a journalist, the most satisfying work I've ever done as a journalist, I believe, was in sub-Saharan Africa as the liberation wars were coming to a close. And I used to spend days on end with people 
interviewing them about what had happened to their families, if they were soldiers in the Liberation Armies, or if, they, if they'd been left behind uh, to, to, kind of to fight the struggle against apartheid while others had gone into the bush or gone into different countries. Building up those profiles of, of individuals over many days, it was like a, a ethnographic work, and it was really tr truly satisfying work. And that, that's what journalism, for me, is at its best. And it's telling very long stories. Mm. So thanks for the question. Thank you very much. And I think uh, now we will close this portion of the program. And let's thank Jeremy Harding again for his talk.